going to start, if you don't mind. Uh, so it's one of the last uh, art salon event uh, on Miami Art Basel to today. Uh, and uh, my name is Annie Cohen Solal. Uh, I came to this country in 1989. I was sent by the French president, Francois Mitterrand, to be uh, representing French culture in the United States. And I was a scholar of somebody called Jean-Paul Sartre. So it's far away from the art world. Not so much, actually. And um, two months, two weeks after I arrived in New York, I was introduced to Leo Castelli at a dinner party. And Leo looked at me from head to toe, and he said to me, I was wearing, actually, a transparent skirt that day. And Leo told me, you are, going, you are not the new cultural counselor. I said, yes, I am. He said, but then I'm telling you that you're going to take New York City by storm, and I'll teach you American art. And tomorrow you come to the gallery, you see the show with Roy, you stay for the dinner, and then you'll follow me. And actually, this is what I did. And that's how I got knowledgeable about American art, because uh, Leo Castelli was my coach, and he was a, a wonderful man. So I devoted four years to write this book, which you see here appeared in, in French, which appeared uh, a month ago in Paris. Will appear in English uh, at the end of April, and in, it, in Italy, in Germany, and in Spain as well. Now, I am very privileged because I, am, I have with me two people who knew Leo Castelli extremely well and that he loved too. Uh, Jim Rosenquist is artist that you know well because he was there yesterday. And Leo adored Jim and there's a wonderful photo with the two of them. And, and Jim, uh, James uh, Meyer, actually it's Annie and the two James today, right? That's what we ca can call this event. Two Annie, for one. And then two for one, you get two James for one. And James Meyer, who met Leo when he was 18 years old, at the time he was called Crazy James, not only for his ties, but f for the kind of funny postcards he would send for Christmas, right? James, don't blush, right? And he was actually coming from London, you'll hear his beautiful British accent, uh, to, rip, to, to develop contemporary art with Sotheby Park Burnett. And he was instrumental in the first, very first, auction sales about contemporary art, uh, especially the one with the skull sale, which is a very big moment in the change of the art market. So today, we got, the three of us are going to evoke the memory of Leo Castelli, and, uh, and we'd love to talk to you as well. Okay, fine? Shall we go? Buckle up? Okay. So the first thing I want to say is that why talk today about Leo Castelli in Miami Art Basel? What is relevant? Is it relevant at all, or is it not relevant to speak about Leo Castelli in Miami Art Basel? I think it is very much relevant. Why? Because um, Miami Art Basel, as I noticed it over the few days I was here, is a real event which is a crossroad, a crossroad between cultures. There are people from South America, there are people from North America, there are people from Europe, and there are people from China, Japan, and all the rest. It's also an event which is interdisciplinary because it's not only the visual arts, but it's design, it's photography, and you have this kind of uh, other fairs around. So it's here a place where, and I, I want to say that I think the idea of Sam Keller to invent this Miami Art Basel is absolutely brilliant because there are collectors from Brazil who discover artists from China, here in Miami. There are uh, collectors from the United States who discover artists from Argentina. There are collectors from Japan who discover artists from, from Cuba and so on and so forth. So what, the reason why I am so interested in the art world as a sociologist and as a historian as I am is that the art world is the best allegory for me for culture and for the culture which is being developed today. And what we saw today, what we saw during this week in Miami Art Basel, is very much an allegory of the globalization of culture, which is going on. And there's nothing better than the art world. Because when you talk about art, you talk about economy, you talk about religion, you talk about gender, you talk about institutions, history, demography, sociology, everything. Now, today, in Miami Art Basel, I could feel that the pulse of Leo Castelli, because this short man 
who arrived in the United States in 1941 from the city of Trieste, Italy, after having lived in Vienna, Bucharest, Budapest, London. This little man carried with him some respect and love for artists that was completely European. Leo said, when I arrived in the United States, the artists were my heroes. And his first friends were de Kuhn. world by discovering artists. So one day at the age of 50, he opened a gallery in his daughter's bedroom and he started showing the artists he just had discovered. And he basically created a cross world, crossroads from New York City by showing the young American artists who were arriving from different states from the United States, Jasper Jones, Bob Rauschenberg, Roy Lichtenstein, Frank Stella, Jim Rosenquist, Andy Warhol, and so on and so forth. And Leo not only showed them, but supported them, um, praised them, promoted them, and in turn started, started the globalization of the art world. That's how I see Leo Gestelli. But I would love to hear James Meyer first, Jim Rosenquist afterwards, and then confront our opinions and then have the floor speak, okay? So Jim, what time did you meet Leo with you? I I met Leo, I suppose, in either, I think, at the end of 69. And um, he was still up in 78th Street. And unlike a lot of new Was, you know, it was a job. Um, with the advent of the, all the artists coming over from Europe, and because the, the European artist had a, was an artist and, um, and could sort of go through all social stratas. So Leo came over with this before the war. Well, in, in Europe, dealers had worked together very strongly. You know, my father was a dealer from 1925 and he worked with Kahnweiler and in Paris, Fleshtime, and they all moved their works around each other. But this didn't really happen in the States so much. And maybe when Leo opened his gallery in the late 50s, about the same time as the advent of the jet airplane, which made travel across the Atlantic feasible easy, you know, we all just assume we can get on a plane nowadays. It was very difficult, but Leo wanted his artists to show, not just in New York, which some other dealers wanted to do. He was very happy to have satellite galleries all over the States and all over Europe. And this was his strength. Lots of people thought that um, he was just letting other people do the work. No, it wasn't. He was very calculated and deliberate to get people from other other countries involved in it. And, and it definitely made a big, Leo's artists are known right through Europe, whereas his contemporary in, uh, dealers in, from the 60s in New York, a lot of their stable of only known in very small areas. And this was Leo's great strength he brought some Europeanism. He brought um, this idea of sharing. Everybody, and it's so much better if everybody shares and and get on, than everybody fight each other. So that was one of Leo's great things. So when you arrived from London, you were 20 years old or something. 19? Yeah. Yeah. So how how did he approach you? How did you approach him? What? Well, I I went to work for Sotheby's. Well, what's now Sotheby's was Park Burnett, then it became Sotheby's Park Burnett, then it became just Sotheby's again. And I noticed that there was a whole yuppie generation of people who were buying art. They were the sons or daughters of collectors, and they were buying their own thing. 
But if they wanted to sell the thing, there was nowhere to sell it, to resell it. Um, because the, most of the dealers dealing in what we consider now the sort of masters of the 60s were, pri were really primary dealers without any secondary thing. And they were getting their 50% or whatever from the artists, and they didn't really feel like reselling something for 10%. So I said that there are a lot of people who want to change their collections. And so till I went, uh, till I went there, if you went into Park Burnett with a Pollock, they didn't know what to do with it. You know, they couldn't, they, they couldn't see putting it with a Renoir and they, couldn't, they didn't know what else to do with it. So I said, you've got this whole market which is crying out um, for some responsible way of having a bourse for reselling these things. Um, it also, so I did the, the first main sale I did was in November 1970 and it was also, sadly, probably when auctions, it was the first auction that became a sort of social event. And the, the fire department nearly closed the place down because the elevators broke. They said there were two, the occupancy was over and done. But anyway, Leo was very instrumental in helping this. He saw the point of it. I'm digressing now. Um, but Leo was always helpful. Leo realized that there was a lot other people, then when I went back to England, I realized that there was a, nobody showing, Robert Fraser had closed his gallery, and nobody was showing any of Leo's artists. So Leo was very helpful in so allowing me to show people such as Jim. Uh, Jim, so we can imagine Leo Castelli, a dealer, I mean a gallerist at the age of 60, who's giving Jim Meyer, age 20, Sorry the responsibility to resell his artists in, in Europe. And one of them is Jim Rosenquist. Jim so, so over to Jim. What was the relationship between Leo and you? OK. I, I met Leo Castelli in 1959 at 4 East 77th Street in his gallery. Young man with his sleeves rolled up, running around the gallery, hanging pictures. And there was like paintings like uh, Jean Follette, maybe a Jasper Johns. People you may not have heard ever hear from again, but they were all quite good artists. And uh, I walked out. And uh, then he came to, I had a studio down on the waterfront in Coenty Slip, and he came down to see me, and he brought down Count Panza. And Count Panza bought three paintings, bang, bang, bang. We have to say, Panza di Biumo was... The was a great, great uh, Italian collector that yeah. first started to buy Bob Rauschenberg by becoming also friendly yeah, with Yeah, he started Leo. off, well, anyway. Yeah, he started, uh, yeah. Then, so Panza uh, bought three pieces of yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, right yeah. Right over. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, but at that point, I was already in a, the Green Gallery with Dick Bellamy, but he's still for friends. I mean, he, Dick was easygoing, a reciprocal, or whatever. And uh, then I was with uh, Bellamy for two sellout shows, I was lucky, two sellout shows. First show, 62. Second show, Museum of Modern Art with Dorothy Miller. Third show with the last with Dick. Dick had personal problems and kept saying that he was going to close his gallery. Not financial problems. He, he was in the black. He sold everything. So anyway, I'm on a plane from Los Angeles right across the seat is Leo. He says, Jim, if you ever think of leaving Dick, please consider me first. I said, OK. So I thought it over about a couple of days, and I joined the Castelli Gallery in 1964. And my first show with, through him was with Ileana Sanabin in Paris. And then at 64, and then in 65, I showed this huge room painting called F-111, and it sold that to Bob Skull. But I want to tell you a story about Leo, because he was, he, he was an amazing guy. I, sub, ne the next show, big show I had was a big painting called Horse Blinders. So I put, it was four, 
covered all the walls of the room, everything, because I was interested in peripheral vision, which you, you, you think of self-consciousness by looking, whatever you look at is that because of the peripheral vision that comes in your eye. That was the motivation for this painting, so both painting. So anyway, Dr. Ludwig came in from Cologne, Cologne. One wall was up and he said, Ach so, Gunshona, I must have this. How much is this? So Leo says, uh, I says, Leo, come back tomorrow. We'll put it all up and then see what he thinks. He came back 9 a.m. the next day. We had it up. He says, Val, what is the cost here for this? And we, the uh, F-111 sold for 45 grand. He says, well, let's make it 60 grand. This is the old days. So wow. <laughs> Leo says, it's sixty thousand dollars, and Ludwig goes, "Pui!" Just then, the phone rang. It was Philip Johnson, the architect. He wanted to buy it. Leo goes back in the back room. He's on the phone. I didn't know what to say. I said, "You know, I didn't was trying to make. I don't know this man." And I said, "You know, in California, I think it was Walter Hickel." sold offshore oil rights in California for 50 million bucks. I said, you know, you can't make a duck with 50 million dollars. Leo came, came back in the room, he says, yes, doctor, we are the ducks. He said, <laughs> so then uh, Ludwig gave his auction sign like, it's mine, and he bought it. Yeah, this, but, is, yeah, <laughs> this is very interesting because Jim is telling us the way Leo, the strategies Leo used yeah. in order to, to, to yeah, no, the relationship say, darling, with the collectors. His, his mission really was, I know, his mission was to, with these young artists in his gallery, get them in good collections. Around the place. He, he get went, them in yeah. good collections, even if he sold them cheaper. Yeah. But just the to visibility get them out, was the... Just to yeah. get them in good collections. And then, when if you're in a good election, other people say, "Hey, yeah. I think well, we want some too." So anyway, that was and I've been with him. I was been him an awful lot, and um, he's <laughs> he's always been equally helpful to collectors and to artists. I mean, he he I won't say who they were, but he gave stipends to a couple artists for hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> And I think maybe one or two never paid him back either. I won't say who that was, <laughs> but I never did. But anyway, do, do you see, do you think that really Leo was more placing art in collections That's than right. selling to the one who wanted them? Yes, you can say that, right? So yeah. he was not about profit. So I stayed with he was good old Leo for 30 years till the very very end. He, I think he I met him when he was about 49, and he, I think he lived in the 90s something. Yeah, 90, 92, 92. 92. So uh, I, I took him to lunch four times before he died. I mean, the year before he died and whatever. And he was uh, always a gentleman. First of all, a gentleman. And I'll tell you another thing that happened. Some kid came in the gallery and he says, where could I see the Rauschenbergers around here? Phil picks up the phone and he says, David, could you take this young man down to see the Rauschenbergs downstairs? The guy says, geez, thanks a lot. Well, this boy was the son of a very wealthy person, so he treat, good old Leo treated everyone equally. I'll tell you another one, too. Which There was a girl working for him named Barbara Wool. I loved her. She was a sweetheart. She had a sort of a bouffant hairdo. She had a little boy to support. She was always asking Leo for a raise. Then one day, Leo came and he said, Jim, remember Barbara? Oh, she left. I said, remember Barbara Wool? I said, yeah. You know who her father is? I said, no. He says, he could have bought my gallery 10 times over and everybody in it. It was Avery Fisher who gave Avery Fisher Hall in, in Lincoln Center. <laughs> So, life, I mean, the, the, the gallery is a whirlwind of uh, personalities, people, experiences, and uh, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, I have made this little video for you so that you see Leo is in different situations. One is here with John Cage, here with his brother and his cousin, and especially you have many photos of 
the Venice Biennial, when Bob Rauschenberg got the Golden Lion in 1964. This is a photo that Bob Adelman, who's sitting in front, did of Leo. And I'm very happy that he's there today. This is Leo between Barnett Newman and Bob Rauschenberg. This is Bob Rauschenberg in his studio in 57. At the time, nobody was interested. His works arriving by plane in, in Venice. This is Venice in 1964. And the whole recognition of Bob Rauschenberg next to Alan Salomon getting the prize now in Venice in 64 was a work of Leo and of Ileana Zonab and his wife, who was who's right here in the photo, who was doing a huge publicity all over Europe in the magazines. So this kind of work was absolutely essential. First of all, to get artists recognized and to get artists promoted and to get artists placed in the best in the best possible. Um, collections. I remember once Jim Rosenquist told me that Leo, the fact that I was showing with Leo legitimized me. Before that, people were not very positive about artists, but showing with Leo gave me status. You remember when you told me that? No, the art world was very small. With my one first one-man show, I was, I didn't think anyone would come. It was on 57th Street, and we my friend Ray and, Ray and I sat on the floor. Lo and behold, 150 people showed up. It was a big surprise. So, Jim, you have something to add to um, the impressions of uh, Jim about how an artist was recognized, promoted? No, I think Jim put it very um, correct and succinctly about, you know, for, for Leo, it was the art and the artist. That was the family. And he really cared more about the family, that family, than anything else. Also, I showed with James Mayer several times, too, in London. I just want to say that. Yeah. Congratulations. Huh? So now. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I'd like to know who has questions. I know that um, Bob Adelman, you have things to say about it. I would love you to say what you feeling was towards Leo that you photographed so much. You want the mic? You want the mic? I'd love you to say something. Well, uh, I, I think uh, Jim got it right when he said Leo was a gent. Uh, uh, he and uh, just as a business practice, uh, he uh, whenever he sent him a bill, he always paid it by return mail, and he and and he was uh, in certain ways he was very. Uh, I think he was very political and didn't tell you things, but occasionally a moment of candor would break through. And I said to him once, I said, you must have a fabulous eye. Uh, uh, you know, you, you found Rauschenberg and uh, Rosenquist and Warhol and Lichtenstein. I said, well, is, is, you know, what is it that, you know, why do you think you've been able to do this? He said, well, Bob, in my business, it's better to have a good ear than a good eye. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing, Bob, is that Leo was born in Trieste. And Trieste, as you, as you know, was a city with no historical identity because he was born in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And then at the age when he turned six, Trieste became part of the Kingdom of Italy. So basically, he switched from Austro-Hungarian about to Italy with a different currency, with a different history, with a different geography. And Trieste was a very weird place to be, to be born and to be raised. Can I uh, inter yeah, inter sure. interject there? But Trieste is right near Venezia. So few people go over there. But it's a beautiful city. And I went over there with him. I had a show there with him. And Italy is full of art lovers. Listen, I'm walking down the street. A window opens up, four stories up, and it goes, Rosenquist, Rosenquist, come, come, vino. The guy comes out with a glass of wine down on the sidewalk, and he brings me up to his refrigerator, and he has an image of my painting on his refrigerator. <laughs> so, and then I became also very good friends with Ili Cafe, Ernesto Ili, who, and I'm still tight with, with good, them. Good, good. So you like espresso, right? Si. But the, the whole thing is that Leo's, Leo's family, Leo's ancestors, Leo's grandparents were involved with the trade of coffee in Trieste. But Leo himself was, started his career in the insurance business that he didn't like at all. But that's my, my position. I think that that's where Leo learned 
the trade of being global. But it's it, a beautiful it, city. It it's is a beautiful, beautiful city. city. Yeah, <laughs> it is a beautiful city. We'll go with you. When do you go next? We'll go. I've been there. Okay. I, I went I, for Ernesto's memorial. I spoke in Italian. Sure, 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 sure. Well, I, you know, I haven't read your book because it's still in French, but. Uh, you know, Leo, in addition to loving art, Close loved up. women. I, I wonder how much of that <laughs> <laughs> is in your book. I, I just out of curiosity. Okay, so let's let the, the, this, the second chapter of the book is Leo and women. You know better than me. Okay, talk mm -hmm. about women, Jim. I haven't read that bit of the book either, I'm afraid. Okay, so Leo. So you've got the horizontal to come. Leo was a seducer. Leo, right, Jim? Leo was a seducer. No comment. Okay, so Leo was a seducer. Apart from that, he so he had a lot of girlfriends. He had three wives, and he had a wandering eye. Right, right. No comment. <laughs> and, and the fact is that he was. Sometimes it might have been better if it kept wandering. What's that? It might have been better if it had kept wandering sometimes. No comment. Okay. So, so anyway, the, uh, to, to go back to the Italian, because, you know, this is the charm of Italian men, if I may say, uh, that uh, Italian, Italian like great lovers, right? You know that. Everybody knows that, right? No? Okay. So Leo was... was okay. No comment. <laughs> so Leo... But Leo was born in Trieste, which was a global city. In Trieste, everybody spoke six languages. And Leo was fluent. That helped enormously. Leo was fluent in English, Italian, German, French, Romanian. Yeah, tell me. Did you write in your book about his war service? Yes, absolutely, in Romania. People, no, in the Amer for the American Army. Yeah, absolutely, CIA. That was another thing. He was in the Secret Service. During the in, for World War II, when he immigrated to America, they immediately drafted him in the army, and he spoke about six languages. So they were going to put him in the I think it was called the OSS at that time, and they said they were going to drop him in Romania by parachute. And then he said, "No, we're not." But they faked him out, and I think they did. Didn't they drop him in there? And he said he and Averill Harriman. There you go. He and Averill Harriman gave the country away to the Russians. I thought, was well, this baloney or what? So I met Averill Harriman, Governor Harriman, and I said, Governor, have you been in Romania? And he says, Yes. And I said, in 1945? Uh, no, I think it was 1946. But I didn't go any further. So obviously it was true. Yeah, yeah. So. Um uh, do you have any other questions from, <laughs> from, the, from the public? I'd love to answer people. Artemis, you have a question. My student. Go ahead. Artemis, you have a question about Leo Castelli. You want to, you want to, I want to see how you link Leo Castelli to, the, to, to Miami Art Basel today. What do you feel? You are, you, are, you are 22 years old. You've been to first in the age of eight. You've been studying what Castelli brought to, to, to the art world. What do you think about the globalization of the art world and how this man must have been shaped it? Um, well, as we have talked before about Leo Castelli, and um, considering the fact that Castelli as a dealer foresaw the globalization, of, the importance of the globalization of the arts, and of, of um, I don't work very well with a microphone. Uh, the fact that um, pre he 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 cared about the administration of his artists in a glo in a global um, environment, a situation that we see that has been normalized in our days, and we can see that through the in the art fair where so many galleries from around the world and collectors from around the world ga gather for this. For like three or four days. Yeah, you know, Leo turned his gallery into a cultural institution, a cultural institution. He had, for example, archives in his gallery that nobody else before had for his artists. So his gallery was a, 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 a place which attracted, you know, collectors, of course, but also critics, journalists, younger people. And Leo would always give out, you know, I mean, uh, um, ectachromes and Ugo articles. Bula. I'm sorry, Ugo, yeah. And, and basically, his gallery became a cultural institution. 
he was, I remember, for example, the, the you know, the, maybe the most important uh, cultural um, professor of art history today at Columbia, Rosalind Kaus. She, was, she worked for Art Forum, but she was at the time doing her PhD at Harvard. And she said, I trusted Leo. I went to his gallery to see his shows, and I knew that I wanted to write about each single show he was doing because I trusted his taste. So basically, he became a test maker. Leo became a test maker. And that's why I think today in Art Basel Miami, we can understand that the gallerist can also become test makers, and, and the curators and the commissioners, those people really feel which place can become a locus for the new, for the new generations of artists and collectors, and how they can really uh, optimize um, you know, their place. Leo did it for New York City in the 60s, definitely. And here, um, what is going on today, I think, is extremely f fascinating. It's my first time in Miami, and I'm ju just really impressed. So who else? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you want that mic? Give it a mic. Uh, having worked in a gallery 25 years ago across the street from uh, Leo Castelli, I think what Leo Castelli has done is he became the Vatican of the artist. Every other gallery was below him. And the artist, uh, 20 and 30 years ago, looked upon him as a god. And he has really elevated. Yes, they have. Uh, Jim, I, I know you may not have, I, because you were within his <laughs> circle. No, but, darling, he was not a god. OK. He was a businessman, a gent. Well, maybe God generous. is a Generous. I loved man. him. He wasn't my god. I know. But you wouldn't be where you are had he not elevated you where you are. <laughs> and Erica, I, uh, Aniko, I was just wondering, who do you see in the 90s and 2010s the new Leo Castelli Gallery? That, that would be... Uh, uh, that would become the new... Uh, I mean, I mean the, uh, this time is gone. This time is gone. I mean, there's nobody today right. which has got... I mean, it's not the same context. Let's, the context was totally different. The context was the one where, you know, the artist was not rich. You know, artists were not making that much money in the, in the 50s. You know, it's a completely different context. I think that the way, for example, Gagosian operates, Gagosian is a gallerist who is interested in collectors less than in artists. Leo was more interested in artists. Leo just loved to discover artists, to protect them, to show them, and to find the best place for them. Gagosian is interested in collectors, and he has his own genius, you know, to discover new collectors, new parts of the world where collectors are booming, you know, like Russia or China. Do you agree with me, or Jim? Well, I would say that the, the real difference is that um, the, the Leo was about generosity, and unfortunately nowadays it's about another G word, greed. No, exactly. No, Le no, no. No, Leo was always no. broke. Yeah, yeah. No. Le Leo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's say, unlike maybe contemporary dealers and collectors, Leo Castelli had an education in art. Well, I just want yeah, to make yeah. it, say one other thing makes it simple here. Why is the Basel Miami Art Fair great? because you only pay one airfare to see almost all what's going on in the rest of the world. So it's cheap. And then the other thing is, in, in, with Leo, at the age of Leo, that the gallery staff were, as Jim said, educated in art. They weren't salespersons. Now, you know, you see advertisements, salesperson required. The last thing the art world needs is another fucking salesman. You know, Leo had a great, great people working for him, and I still remain friends with some of them. One was even my wife. We're still friendly. <laughs> <laughs> and, Sir? And there's a number of others. Really great people. Hi. Um, my question is um, uh, basically globalization. Um, Leo Castelli, et cetera, maybe probably were the pioneers on globalization, right? Um, 
um, perhaps we are experiencing globalization nowadays. Um, what is beyond of what we're looking now in 2009, 2010, bringing our vassal to Miami? Can we see our vassal in Bogota, Managua, Kenya, South Africa, any of these places, or, or, can, or, or what is your vision of globalization and the art sensibility? No. Uh, he, some people didn't understand your question. Can you can you repeat it? Because he, Jim didn't repeat I, it slowly. Yes, actually, the what is the vision of the mission, vision, or vision, mission, the yes, vision, vision of the art world and and the globalization sensibility. You know, we we have seen the you know the art globalizes the vision. Yes, yes. we have seen the art being just not only in certain pockets of the world, like New York, London, and yes. what have you. Yes, It's so, all very simple. I have a simple answer to that. If and when an artist, no matter where he is, Afghanistan, Iran, India, anywhere, Africa, anywhere, when they do something that takes no, people notice, they get noticed in their community. And if they get really good, they start to get noticed globally. And that why that, that works better and better and better because of communication. Years ago, you could practice, you may be able to hide somewhere and not be noticed for some years. Not anymore. Someone will find you, pick you up, and they'll put you right on the front page if you're fantastic. So it's very hard to so hide I, from publicity. I, I, want, I want to answer you about that. I, I, that's the thing I'm interested in these days in my research and in, with my students. A global observatory of the visual arts. We have a history of visual arts of centers developing in Europe. You know, Florence at the end of the 15th century, it was a place where the artists would find the best patron and the best masters. Why did Perugino go to Florence instead of staying in Perugia? Because in Florence, that were, that were, that's where he found excellence. Why Amsterdam in the 17th century? Why Paris in the 19th century? Why New York in the 20th century? Now the story is completely different because the Western world kept it for themselves. But now, and I think there was a very important show in Paris in 1989 called Magicians of the Earth where Jean-Hubert Martin showed Western artists and non-Western artists. He showed people from the United States, France, and Germany, together with Aborigines from Australia, people from South America, people from Cuba. That was a landmark exhibition, Magicians of the Earth. And that started biennials all over the world, which were rivaling and showing that those cultures ex existed, those young artists existed. Those people had remained invisible quotation mark, for the eye of the Western man for thousands of, of years. So now what is fascinating and essential is that we are discovering minds of artists from India, from Korea, from Cuba, of course, from China, from Russia, that the Western men who were running the world did not see before. But I think my position is that in order for artists to thrive in a place it's not enough that they, that they work. They need around them gallerists and collectors. So they need to be supported, they need to be seen, they need to show somewhere. And for example, I come from a country called Algeria. In Algeria there are artists, but there are no market. There's no market because there are no gallerists, you see? So what is very important today is to help those artists be showed and and be existing through the, through the arrival, through the movement of galleries, curators, commissioners. And that's why it's so important that Documenta in 2002 was done by Enwizor, who was a guy from Nigeria. You know, so it's very important that curators, that gallerists, and that collectors move around and meet each other. So I think that's a key. For the, the, you know, for, for the future of the art world, which is, for me, the best way to understand the world, really. Yeah, Bob? Yeah. 
Yes, yes. The other thing I, I, I wanted to ask you, just as a personal matter, uh, Emil D'Antonio and an, an, a woman friend of uh, uh, ours tried to do biographies of Leo, and, and didn't, it did, they didn't work out. Why Judith think, Goldman. Yeah, Judith Judith, Goldman. Yeah, why do you think you were able to break through somehow? I don't know. Because I had the training to be a historian. I don't know. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah, she, she, she's a curator. She's. I mean, it's it's a, it's something which requires four years of, of of hell. So I worked hell for four years. Listen, <laughs> I think. Congratulations. Yes. Thank you. So I want to say thank you to. Uh, yeah, you have another question. Yeah. Me. Speak about very uh, about the difference between Leo Castelli and Peggy Guggenheim in this time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Peggy Guggenheim was a collector from Europe who came to the United States when she was married married with Max Ernst in 1941, and oh. she started showing surrealism. And Leo had showed surrealist artists in Paris for a short time, so they met in New York. And she supported a lot of people. She supported Jackson Pollock. She was the first one who made him and put him on the payroll. And Leo and her were very, very close. And she did these extraordinary shows curated by Marcel Duchamp together with André Breton, you know. And, and, but Peggy decided to go back to Europe with her own collection in 1948. And she arrived at the time that the first biennial in Venice took place after the war. And in her pavilion, she showed the new American artists like Pollock and so on, integrated in art history. And it was, I mean, a, a, a wonderful moment. So Leo and, and, of course, and Peggy were friendly, and they, together they were meshing, you know, what came from Europe and what came from the United States. And they are what I call passer, you know, go-between. I think it's very important in the art world to talk about, you know, these these agents of cross-fertilization. So the curators, the dealers, the commissioners are cross-fertilizers between culture. And that's what we're celebrating today. Thank you very much. Thank you to Celia to welcome us. And see you next year. Bye-bye.